Good afternoon. I have the, the most lucky position of being the last person on this panel after lunch and after the Cubs won the World Series last night, so, which I watched. So, um, I'm here to tell you about the Hearst Tower. Now, you may have heard about the Hearst Tower. We're winning the 10-year award, which is really, really humbling. Um, but uh, I'm gonna tell you a little history about the tower first. So there it is, William Randolph Hearst uh, commissioned Joseph Urban, an architect, to design the Hearst Tower back in the 1920s. It was built uh, as a six-story building, but it was built as the first phase of a two-phase project. The project was supposed to have a building on top of it. In fact, it was always meant to be a base of a taller building, but when the Depression hit in, 19, in, the, in the late 20s, early, early 30s, uh, Hearst fell onto some bad financial times, and uh, the tower uh, was not realized. When things got better in the 40s, uh, they looked at it again uh, in the 50s, in the 60s. It became an ongoing joke. When is the building ever going to be finished? Um, and uh, luckily, uh, back in the 90s, when technology was taking hold and the corporation was now in 13 locations around the neighborhood, uh, and people were starting to think about upgrading systems and technology in their buildings and leased and owned properties, somebody said, wait a minute, it may be a good idea to consolidate everybody into one place. And ultimately, we owned this property, and so what better place to build a new building? However, the building had since been landmarked and there was no precedent at the time to overbuild a landmark building. The good news was is that with discussions with the New York City Landmarks Commission, uh, it was, uh, let's say, agreed to that the building always intended to have a tower on top of it, so why not realize it now? Uh, in the words of Joseph Urban, architecture should be as much a part of the time and of the place as the current news. And so in keeping with that, when you're building a building in the early 21st century, the building should reflect that. And landmarks didn't have any really desire to have us build a building that looked like this, but build something a little different. So we set course on building the Hearst Tower and a little history. So if you look at the, the first picture, it was a horseshoe shaped building with uh, a courtyard in the middle. So in order to restore and uh, maintain uh, the ac exterior facade of the original building, uh, we had to work very carefully from the inside out. It was a building, if you look to the, to just to the west of us, which closed in our courtyard. So it was very interesting. We had to sort of eat the apple from the inside out. But we also had to structurally support all that original facade. Building the tower up through the center, as you see, some of the, uh, the work had some tight tolerances. In fact, when I first came on to the project in 2004, uh, the diagrid hadn't been even assembled yet. And I, I asked the contractor uh, from Turner Construction, I said, so what's the thing that keeps you up at night? And he said, the diagrid. <laughs> He said, I don't know how we're going to do it. Are we going to build it down on the, uh, 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 horizontally and then erect it vertically? Are we going to put it up together vertically? I don't know how it's going to work out. Thankfully, it worked out so swimmingly well <laughs> that uh, he, was, he was very relieved, as, as were we. So the finished project. So, as you can see, we have these great atrium space, and you walk in and you see this, the, this great uh, water feature we call ice fall, and the tower stands, stands tall, set back uh, from, from the original 1928 urban structure. Uh, I worked there. It is a wonderful, wonderful place to work. There was another thing that happened, uh, just take it back again to 2001, it was mentioned before about 9-11. The, the meeting, uh, the Hearst meeting, the board meeting, to decide uh, on whether to go ahead with a project or not. In fact, it was the presentation that Lord Norman Foster was going to make to the board of directors was scheduled for September 12th of 2001. 
So the morning of 9-11, uh, the uh, Lord Foster, actually he was Sir Foster at the time, uh, was in our uh, executive's office preparing for the meeting the next day, which uh, for a lot of reasons didn't happen. And uh, so what was interesting in New York City, what was happening at New York City in 2001, September 2001, was first of all, nobody's going to be in a tall building. You know, as mentioned before, what, what's, the re what, what's the response of the council to 9-11? Nobody's going to be in a tall building. Certainly nobody's going to consolidate all their people in one place. And New York is, is a non-starter. It's a target, get out of New York. So those three things were, were very, very real things that were happening in people's, were going on in people's minds at the time. Hearst did convene their board meeting about six weeks after 9-11, late October of 2001. Uh, it was still very, very, uh, it was still smoldering downtown. It was, a bad, it was a bad scene. Yet Hearst decided and voted unanimously to stay in New York, consolidate all their people, and build an iconic building in Manhattan. The first building commissioned after 9-11. I, I, for one, am very proud of that fact. And, uh, but, but building a building post 9-11 has some challenges. You have to make sure that you're going to build it safe and secure. And you need to, you need to now convince all of your 2,000 people that this is a good thing, to, this is a good decision. So we spent a lot of effort in, and with our structural engineers and with our, uh, our security experts, how are we going, and with architects, how are we going to design this building to be as strong or stronger than, than initially, initially conceived? So if you look at the uh, skylight, that's actually a ring beam. Now, I am not a structural engineer, nor do I play one on TV, but I was, that, that uh, the structure was designed specifically to protect the tower from a blast from the street. So if something were to happen, an incident to happen on the street, that that blast would be uh, absorbed by the structural uh, uh, of, the, of the skylight of the atrium space. The mega columns, we call them mega columns in the atrium, uh, are, uh, are box columns and they're filled with concrete up to about 15 feet. And that was to create some more inertia for the, for the structure. Uh, our stairwells were widened. Our air handling system for the mailroom, again, post 9-11, we had the anthrax things. We had a lot of other security qu questions coming up. We have air systems that um, are to totally separate from the rest of the building. And uh, so there's fresh air. The uh, mailroom itself and the loading dock are all blast resistant as well. Uh, not that we thought that Hearst was going to be a prime target, but it was the kind of thing that you have to do in a post 9-11 world in New York City to make sure that your occupants are as safe as you possibly can make them. And, and what I didn't mention is that this, this building is a little different than most buildings, and I'd worked for a number of companies prior to this. This is our home. Uh, every detail of the project was, was, uh, was reviewed and toiled over and reviewed again. Uh, by the so senior management. This was not delegated down to an architecture committee or to uh, the head of facilities. This was a w monthly meeting with the most senior executives of the company to choose what color carpet we were going to have and to, and to choose the finishes. So it was as if you were designing someone's home and that's how, we, that's how we look at this. So our home and it's our family and we take care of them. So, talked about uh, 10 years. Right, so a lot happens in 10 years and in, in the life of a building. And you know, we, we, uh, you know, I'm very humbled with the group here and talking about design and talking about urban planning. Well, we have to sustain the test of time. And our business, uh, uh, the media business, has changed very much in the last 10 years. When we first moved in, we designed our workplace uh, and we were very cognizant of our demographic. We were about 80 to 85 percent women in our building. And one would say, so how does that affect the architecture? And I would ask the same question. But there were a lot of talk, there was a lot of talk about how do we design our space to appeal to that demographic majority. So one thing was looking at the workstation itself. You know, we had a, 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 a of a varying array of workstations uh, in the 13 different locations we were in. I mean, everything from open plan to high cubes to what, whatnot. And we need to standardize. 
But we also didn't want to be, uh, we were going to be evolutionary, not revolutionary. And it was, very, it was very carefully thought out as to how much change our, our, our people could take. And this was the end result. We went with a, a workstation that was four feet high. We built a little closet and we included a mirror. Again, most of our magazines in the building are fashion-focused magazines, so the people who work there are very, very cognizant of their appearance. Uh, we built um, spaces specifically for shoes, because this we knew when we walked around the, 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 all of our offices around the area, there were a lot of consistencies. There were two things that we saw at every workstation. There was a sweater on the back of the chair, and there were shoes underneath the desk. And not one pair of shoes, not two pairs of shoes, like 10 pairs of shoes. I, I wear my shoes to work, I wear them all day, I come home, but that's a little personal, sorry. But th the point is, is that they, had, they kept a lot of shoes. Well, we didn't want to see the sweaters on the desk, so we built this little closet, and we built a place for the shoes, and we also set the workstation, workstation height slightly lower than standard. It's adjustable, but we set it slightly lower than, than what you normally would because the demographic was a little shorter than the average human being. So uh, it worked. It worked really well. And there were other things we did in the building. In fact, the bathrooms for most of the tower, typically you'd have 50%, uh, you split the, the, the core bathrooms 50%, 50%. No, we didn't do that. We made the women's bathroom one stall larger and the men's was one stall smaller. Uh, so and that's, a, that's a lifetime decision. So it was a very bold decision to make. We also upgraded the restrooms. The restrooms are all stone. The, the, uh, the stalls are very private. They go from six inches to almost seven feet. Uh, the hooks on the back of the doors for the stalls, uh, we say are sweater friendly. So uh, they don't poke holes in, in sweaters, and that was a big deal. Uh, the lighting, the mirrors, all these things are very, very important. Uh, and there were a lot of other things that we considered in the design of the building. So 10 years. So we moved in in 2006. Now 2006 seems like it wasn't that long ago, 10 years. But in technology, in the technology world, that's, well, six, it's almost like they say dog years, right? So it's like 50 years actually 70 years ago. So, what happened? You may have heard of some of these names. These have all impacted the Hearst business significantly, has changed the entire dynamic of our business. How we communicate and how we produce newspapers, magazines, share information, social media has completely blown the lid off of our business. Advertising dollars are now spread across many, many more platforms than ever. And we have to respond to that. And the, the workforce has to respond to that. So while we designed a workplace for these people, the workplace now looks more like this, okay? With a couple exceptions of myself. <laughs> There's a few of us still there just to keep some balance. But it's a totally changed demographic. It's a changed workforce. It's a digital workforce. And when we build a building, you have to build in some flexibility because you don't know what the future has in the store. And you're also not gonna spend, or at least my management is not intended to prepare to spend you know, tens of millions of dollars on new furniture. So where we started with workstations that had two workstations next to, each other, next, next to each other with a closet in the middle. We also built in the flexibility to remove that, that center cabinet so we could have sort of the exception to the rule that if you had to have three people across or four people across, you could do that. That was always thought in 2006, that was the interns. Now it's reversed. Now the rule is three across and the exception is the two next to each other. Our, our, each floor was designed originally for 85 people maximum. We now have 140, 150. Some floors have tried to push a little higher and we've had to pull them back, but it's, it's a much changed work environment. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about sustainability because that's another big, big feature of the building. Sustainability came to Hearst through Lord Foster. 
When we built the building, he said you should build it green. We didn't know exactly what that meant. We thought he meant it should look green. Uh, but uh, no, he was very clear on you need to be, build a sustainable building. And here's how you do it. Here's the LEED system. And we achieved LEED gold for new construction. And we were the first building in New York City to achieve LEED gold new construction inside and out. Uh, seven World Trade Center, to give him credit, so Larry Silverstein built Seven World Trade Center LEED gold for base building only. We have it for both inside interiors and, and exteriors. We then in 2012 said, you know what? There were a lot of, um, there's always a lot of question about whether you, know, you build it right, but do you operate it right? You know, anybody can build it right, but this is where the rubber hits the road. So we achieved LEED platinum for existing buildings, uh, EBOM, in 2012. That was probably my proudest moment from a sustainability standpoint, because the, the culture of the building had changed such that we were always looking to, to raise the bar. And the day after we achieved LEED Platinum uh, was the day I turned to my, the guy who did my LEED and said, you have four years, 364 days to do this again. Because as we all know, the LEED existing building is a five-year deal. And I'm honored to share with you today that two weeks ago, we received our LEED existing buildings for 2016, again in Platinum. As most of you know, that is not that easy to do. <laughs> so. In closing, I want to share uh, a, vid a short video of Lord Norman Foster uh, uh, talking about the building uh, most recently. There are so many aspects which make this project unique. The idea that you're using the most up-to-date technology, something that literally didn't exist 10 years ago to capture the building now, 10 years on. That's, I think, very symbolic. It's one thing perhaps to come in through the front door to look and to see the space, but to actually move through it. There's something I, I think that one never takes for granted. For me, walking in here and seeing this sense of community, takes me back in time uh, to the very earliest days of the project. I mean, the idea that it is a marriage of the old and new, the most sustainable tower at that time. The idea that the base could be like the town square, the piazza, everybody would pass through it, was so exciting, so radical. And to incorporate that, with the Jamie Carpenter, work of art, ice fall, which is also part of the environmental system of the building and inseparable from the way that the roof harvests the rainwater. It takes a very enlightened client to be able to work together to create something at this scale with works of art incorporated not as afterthoughts, but integral to the design. I think that's a great tribute to Hearst. Technologically, the building was, in terms of elevators, the most advanced of its kind. So when you step out of the elevator door, every level, there are different worlds. Each floor, whether it's popular mechanics, opera, they all have their own identity. Charlie, I'll call you back, I'll call you back. But good housekeeping is completely different. They're testing products, it's generating heat, smells, vapors. Normally, you could never think of putting that in an office tower. The idea that you can change the scale and you can also incorporate historic rooms and you're transported back in time when you enter that space, I think that's just, well, it's really great. The philosophy of integrating the workplace with artists, with ecology, with views, permeates its way through the whole building. This is, is truly a home. I mean, I work here. In that sense, I'm part of the community. I can't say that about any other building, no matter how close I get to it.
So, he, so he, Lord Foster says it better than I could ever say it. Uh, what I mention is that he is the only non-Hurst tenant in the building, that he does have half a floor in the building since we opened up, and uh, we're happy to have him there. So, uh, you know, the title of, the, 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 of this presentation was Integrating Old and New. And what I found is that's, that's kind of the goal, is, is we're always trying to integrate new. Because with the world changing as fast as it is, we have to constantly be making changes and, and adjusting. Uh, what's been a fantastic experience for me with the Hearst Tower is that it was built and designed in such a way that it can uh, integrate very, very easily. And we've, I'm looking forward to, to uh, the next 10 years. So thank you very much. Thank you.